Today is Saturday, October 19th. Election Day is just over two weeks away now, but the preparations have been going on for years at this point, in part because of a more contentious, sometimes violent, political environment. Steps are being taken to avoid another Capitol riot. Polling places are getting security upgrades. And there's been record turnover among election workers who have faced more threats in recent years. So today, our guest is Chris Harvey. He worked as Georgia's elections director for the most volatile years in elections in the state's history so far. And in 2021, he got back into law enforcement, setting training standards for all of Georgia's peace officers. He's also a member of the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections, a nonpartisan group that brings law enforcement and elections experts together. Here's our conversation about the state of political violence in America, how election officials are preparing, what it felt like to face death threats, and more. Welcome, welcome to the Newsworthy Special Edition Saturday, when we sit down with a different expert or celebrity every Saturday to talk about something in the news. Don't forget to tune in every Monday through Friday for our regular episodes, where we provide all the day's news in 10 minutes. I'm Erica Mandy. It's now time for today's Special Edition Saturday. Chris Harvey, thanks for joining us again on the Newsworthy. My pleasure. Before we talk about the specifics that you're looking at there in Georgia, I am curious if you have a sense of the current state of political violence in America. Anytime you're looking at, at very close elections, everything gets amplified. And people have had, you know, four years of, of listening to, to different theories and people espousing different ideas about what they think happened or didn't happen. And so I think the potential for, for political violence is higher than, than it's been in my lifetime, certainly. Some reports have said there are new measures around the country for election officials like bulletproof glass and panic buttons. Are you seeing that where you are? I am. Um, I can tell you that in in many of the new elections offices that have either been built or renovated since 2020, uh, many of them have included things like uh, bulletproof glass, things like ballards that are put up in, in front, extra locks, lighting, cameras, things like that. One county in Georgia uh, is using uh, is going to be using panic buttons that poll workers will have that will send a signal to uh, to law enforcement and to, to a representative to alert them that there's a problem at a polling place. They're still working through some of the details about determining what, what constitutes a, a pushing of the panic button because you don't want somebody that's too eager to push a panic button if somebody's just having a disagreement, but you also want the ability to summon law enforcement uh, very quickly if there's an emergency. How do you feel about the fact that some of these measures are at least perceived as needed now and really only in the last four years? Unfortunately, I I agree that a lot of them are needed. Um, And that's just the sad experience that that election officials in in Georgia have been living with for, you know, for four years uh, that I lived through it through 20 and 2021 when I was the elections director. You know, it would be great to go back to a time when uh, you know, elections were boring and uh, and they happened without a lot of fanfare and people focused on the results. I don't think that time is is happening uh, anytime soon. And in the meantime, it's it's really the responsibility of the election officials to keep themselves safe, keep the voters safe and keep the process safe and, and continuing. I know you've personally been threatened in the past. Can you tell us again about that and, and what it was like after the 2020 election, when all the controversy was swirling, after it was determined that uh, that Joe Biden had won Georgia in a surprise surprise victory, uh, we had to do a, a statewide runoff for the U.S. Senate that it unusually involved two U.S. senators that was going to determine the out you know who who controlled the Senate. And the day before that election, I got a call from somebody in D.C. who said that I had been docs that my home address and picture of my house and picture of me had been put on the dark web and that I had had an email that said that my days were numbered and that I was going to essentially be killed uh, at some point when I left the house. You know, in my case, I'd been a, I'd been a law enforcement officer since 1995. So it wasn't quite as disturbing as, as it may have been for somebody else who hadn't kind of, you know, worked in that world. I'd worked homicide for a majority of my career. So it wasn't unusual to, to have people not happy with my work. But, you know, at the time I had my wife and four kids at home, there was so much unrest. Everything was so chaotic. And and I know that many election officials in Georgia went through very similar things uh, to different degrees. Some of them got emails, some of them got phone calls. Some of them were even sort of accosted personally. It's tragic and disgraceful, frankly, that, that people that in, in many cases have devoted their entire careers to to providing the service to, to their citizens, to to make sure that they have the right to vote, you know, legally and safely, are then turned around and blamed for 
uh, stuff that, uh, that they had no no part in, making allegations that were that were baseless. Yeah, and to that point, I mean, a CBS News investigation found more than a third of all top election officials have quit or retired since the 2020 presidential election. Have you noticed a trend like that where you are, and and what's the potential impact of that happening? I have noticed it. I, I you know, after 2020, I think um, about seven of the largest counties in Georgia had new elections directors. You know, some of that was was you know general retirement, but I think a lot some of those people that that chose to retire chose to retire um, because of what they've been through in 2020. Generally, people that work in elections work in elections their whole career. So if you've got people that have been working in elections for 20, 25, 30 years, that's a tremendous amount of institutional knowledge and experience. And when that walks out the door, somebody else has to start and pick up. And to try to do that in that environment, in the post-2020 environment, was was incredibly difficult. Uh, now, to the best of my knowledge, the people that have, have stepped up have done a great job. Um, but it's hard to replace uh, experience like that. Do you feel that this kind of environment comes from the top, some, you know, high profile politicians? Do you think it's just the divisive nature of our country right now? Where, where do you think this is really coming from? In Georgia, we've seen it uh, across party lines. We've seen, you know, people that were frankly, uh, frustrated with elections uh, prior to, to 2016. I think a lot of it has to do with a lot of just the general political polarization um, and the fact that elections are so close that everybody sees the possibility that, you know, oh, we're so close to, to winning. If we just do the next thing, uh, maybe that'll push us over the edge. The stakes seem to be a lot higher. So I can't lay the blame at, at any one, one person or party. But to be clear, you don't feel there was any fraud in 2020? No, no, there was. I, I And I believe that, you know, multiple recounts, including a hand recount, have, have verified the results. You know, no election is perfect. You're talking about millions of people doing something in 12 hours. But there are so many redundancies and safeguards. And, and in this case, in 2020, audits and a hand count of every presidential vote um, have, have backed up the fact that the results were consistent. Tell me a little bit more about how things have changed from a violence and threat and safety perspective. In 2020, even though the election was very close, most of the problems happened after the voting stopped. In 2024, they're going to go to vote with these ideas and with these um, thoughts in their head. And I think it's going to create a much more tense atmosphere at polling places. I think anything that happens that's perceived as a mistake or something that's done is going to be viewed through a very political lens. And I think people will assume the worst in every case. Whereas prior to 2020, I think most people tended to believe that, you know, sometimes people make mistakes and sometimes they're errors and they were willing to sort of let it go. But now it seems like everything is is viewed through a political lens. Do you have actual concerns about the election integrity? No, the election itself, um, I'm confident that the the results um, are going to be what they are. I mean, I, I can say in Georgia, I know the election officials, many of whom I know personally, are, are some of the most dedicated people that put their, you know, really their, their heart and souls and their lives into making sure that they do a good job, making sure that they produce accurate results, making sure that they follow the laws and the rules. Still ahead, what types of threats Chris Harvey has seen so far this year? and whether he expects a repeat of January 6th, plus what law enforcement is doing to try to prepare now, and his take on how voters should approach the election in the face of this new era of divisiveness and threats. But first, a break for our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Haya. As parents, we always want to do what's best for our kids, but there's a lot to think about. So I love that I found an easy way to make sure my toddler is getting the nourishment he needs. Not only do Haya's children's vitamins fill the most common gaps in modern children's diets, but also these vitamins taste great, or at least my kiddo thinks so, because he's literally so excited to take one every morning. Seriously, he runs to the pantry to get them and is thrilled to take his vitamins. And unlike other options, Haya is made with zero sugar and zero gummy junk. So I feel great about giving him these every morning. We actually give him both the best-selling children's vitamins and the kids' probiotic. Both are pediatrician-approved chewables that he's been taking for a year and a half now. Even before Haya was a sponsor, we chose Haya. And we've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash newsworthy. This deal is not available on their regular website, so go to H-I-Y-A 
H-E-A-L-T-H, HayaHealth.com slash Newsworthy, and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. This episode is also brought to you by ZocDoc. Even when we do everything we can to take care of ourselves, sometimes we need a little extra support to keep us healthy or help us recover. We all deserve a team of experts who care. And when it comes to our health, there is no compromise. Don't go back to that doctor who makes you feel bad or uncomfortable. Instead, check out ZocDoc. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare high-quality in-network doctors, choose the right one for your needs, and click to instantly book an appointment. We're talking about in-network appointments with more than 100,000 healthcare providers across every specialty, from mental health to dental health, eye care to skin care, and much more. Plus, ZocDoc appointments happen fast, typically within 24 to 72 hours of booking. You can even score same-day appointments. I check ZocDoc anytime I'm looking for a new doctor to support my most valuable asset, my health. So stop putting off those doctor's appointments and go to ZocDoc.com slash newsworthy to find and instantly book a top-rated doctor today. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash newsworthy. ZocDoc.com slash newsworthy. Okay, now back to our conversation. Have there already been threats you're seeing so far this election season? And how are you helping election workers from a safety perspective already? I don't know that there have been any specific threats. I know there have been sort of rumblings um, and there's been just the the proliferation of stories on social media about groups that are preparing to to monitor the election or or be watchdogs or or audit the election, that kind of stuff from a sort of a self-proclaimed point of view is is a little bit problematic because you know voting is supposed to be something that's done in a in sort of a stress fee free intimidation free environment what we've been doing to try to alleviate that is to to get law enforcement officials and election officials in the same room talking developing plans learning about what each side can and can't do um, and and getting them ready to work through some scenarios so that they actually encounter some some possibilities, things like bomb threats, even things like uh, you know gas leaks or a, a polling place becomes unavailable, uh, civil unrest, um, machine failures, all that stuff. Uh, as soon as something happens in an election in a polling place, it's almost going to invariably you know filter out and ripple out and have effects on on people in the in the area. And so we want law enforcement to be aware of those things and to be able to be able. To respond and, and be agile in their response. Can you explain what the rules are in terms of people loitering or standing there at the polling place and what you as law enforcement can and can't do? The places inside a polling place where voters are actually voting, you can't go beyond a line back to where voters are actually casting ballots. But in, in the other areas of the polling place, um, people are allowed to come and observe as long as there's space. Poll managers in Georgia do have the ability to sort of limit access if it's creating a problem for voters or if it's interfering with with voters. You know, from a law enforcement perspective, we're we're trying to educate law enforcement on what specific laws exist um, and also how those laws are generally, how they're dealt with. For example, in Georgia, it's illegal to wear a shirt with a candidate's name into a polling place to vote. Uh, But 99.9% of the time, if somebody does that, The election official is going to approach the voter, tell them, explain why they can't do that, offer the voter a chance to, you know, turn their shirt inside out or put a jacket on or something like that. Um, And and most of the time the voter complies and it's no issue. And in those cases, you know, law enforcement should do nothing. (laughs) They should they should be there um, waiting to respond to serious threats, uh, disturbances, acts of violence, uh, obvious intimidation, things like that. But but law enforcement should not be the center of attention at a polling place. Do you expect to see anything similar to what happened after the 2020 election and the Capitol riot on January 6, 2021? I do expect to see in, in cases where you've got very close elections, I expect to see a tremendous amount of scrutiny after the election when you get into things like audits and recounts and reconciliation and and people that are, you know, nitpicking and, and looking through the details of the election. I do expect that. Um, I, I certainly would not expect and certainly don't hope for the kind of uh, violence we saw on January 6th. So I do expect the, the post-election time to be maybe even more tense than, than the election time, because while people are still voting, you know, there's nobody really knows the results. And then afterwards is when people will 
be more likely to start making allegations and accusations. Do you feel that the 2024 election can continue to be smooth even with some of these concerns? Oh, absolutely. Um, and I'm, I'm confident that people in Georgia and, and, and hopefully around the country are going to do a great job. I think the one silver lining out of, out of this dark cloud is that, you know, I think most people have kind of doubled down on, on their procedures and some of the stuff that maybe they had taken for granted, they've really shored up and, and they realize that there's very, very little margin for error. Do you have just a final thought or takeaway for our audience? One of the worst things that could come out of these increased tensions is that people people stop voting and people um, acquiesce in in the face of threats and tensions and and strife and and that's not uh, that's not the America that's uh, that's sustained for almost two hundred fifty years and so I hope everybody, regardless of their political persuasion, goes out proudly and, and bravely and strongly and exercises the right to vote. Thank you so much to Chris Harvey for sharing his experience and expertise with us. And for any election officials, law enforcement, or community leaders who want to be more prepared for this year's election, it's not too late. Check out the resources at safeelections.org. Thank you so much for listening today. Stay up to date with all the news you need about the election and beyond with our 10-minute news roundups every Monday through Friday. You can follow us in your favorite podcast app for free so you never miss an episode. We'll be back with the news you need to start the week on Monday. So until then, have a great weekend.